Hello, my name is Jess Keener Haas, and I am joined by my colleagues, Gina Colarassi, Shonda Talin, and Ronnie Russell. Today, we will be discussing the manifestation determination, a review of removal to alternative education for disruptive youth programs. Patton's mission. The mission of the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network, Patton, is to support the efforts and initiatives of the Bureau of Special Education and to build the capacity of local education agencies to serve students who receive special education services. PDE's commitment to least restrictive environment or LRE. Our goal for each child is to ensure individualized education program teams begin with the general education setting with the use of supplementary aids and services before considering a more restrictive environment. AEDY programs. They are temporary and disruptive by definition of 1901C, a student who poses a clear threat to the safety and welfare of other students or staff creates an unsafe school environment or whose behavior materially interferes with the learning of other students or disrupts the overall education process. Disciplinary protections within IDEA are ensured for students who are also thought to be eligible and have yet to be identified for special education services. Criteria for placement or a removal to an AEDY program. There are currently six criteria. As you review students with disabilities you may, who may be placed in AEDY programs, it is critical that they meet the criteria listed on this slide. The first and last criteria should have substantial data prior to referral. As you are aware, MTSS provides a framework for supporting students at each level of intervention. Students placed for disruptive behaviors within an AEDY program have received supports at all tiers prior to their placement in an AEDY program within their general education program. The AEDY team has done work in training the field in building positive behavior support frameworks over the past year. By example, we discuss core supports as being two and a half hours of counseling, creating, teaching, and reinforcing the AEDY program's behavior matrix through lessons within the classroom delivered by that licensed or certified counselor. Our team, after much conversation with you in the field, began to develop an MTSS graphic specific to our AEDY programs. The graphic describes the process of tier one supports in AEDY and the delivery of core academic and behavioral supports through tier three, specific to that formal periodic review process. While AEDY is defined as a temporary placement for discipline, programming in AEDY needs to provide for a focused opportunity to interconnected systems of support for the students placed. All EDY programs must provide academic and behavioral instruction through core directed activities using evidence-based practices. Using an MTSS framework for positive behavior support, teams are required to define their core supports, inclusive of the counseling that we just discussed. AEDY programs are also expected within core instruction and practice to define, analyze, implement, educational and behavioral programs that meet each criteria identified in the center of our graphic here as appropriate. Further, AEDY teams create measurable goals, which are highly individualized with specific interventions as documented in the formal periodic review process, which occurs minimally every 45 school days. AEDY teams must interconnect systems that envelop the student with individual, academic, and behavioral instruction and intervention. Discipline, does it meet the intended result? Why is this question important? Student suspensions are an intervention frequently used in schools in an attempt to control student behavior. During the 2011-2012 school year in the United States, 
3.5 million students were disciplined by in-school suspension and 3.45 million by out-of-school suspension. These statistics are especially troubling because African-American and economically disadvantaged students are overrepresented in school suspension data. The most common rationale for suspending students is to deter students from future infractions of school conduct rules. Unfortunately, many students find school far more aversive than the punishment. With our knowledge of human behavior, this suggests that suspensions may in other ways negatively impact the very students who are at the greatest risk for failure in our schools, increasing the frequency of suspensions and the number of students who drop out of the system. This data mining piece seeks to answer the following questions. Does suspension produce significant unintended consequences that harm the students it was intended to help? So as a team, you might answer these questions. How do you evaluate the type and number of student removals from middle and high school programs? How much instructional time and opportunities were missed? How will programs improve the achievement gap without closing the discipline gap? When we look at suspension data, um, the CRDC collects information about exclusionary discipline practices, including out-of-school suspensions and expulsions. Out-of-school suspension is an instance in which a child is temporarily removed from his or her regular school for at least half a school day for disciplinary purposes. Expulsion refers to removing a child from his or her regular school for disciplinary purposes. An expulsion can occur with or without educational services provided to the students. So if we look at these data, um, we're seeing in the first column, we're seeing the percentage of male enrollment. In the second column, we're seeing in comparison, um, male out of school suspensions. And we, can, we see that several racial groups are represented. So if you look at the male enrollment, we have 25% of students who are um, indicated as white students. And then when we look at out of school suspensions, we see that 24% of those students, 24% um, of out of school suspensions are represented by white male students. And that is congruent with male and white male student enrollment. But when we go up and we look at um, the percentage for black or African American male students, there are there is an 8% enrollment rate. But when we look at the percentage of out of school suspensions, 25% of out of school suspensions are being contributed to black or African American students. So that is supporting the statement that um, black and Af or African American students are being overrepresented when it comes to um, out of school suspensions. And when we look at female enrollment data, we're seeing the same pattern um, with black students. So suspensions from school are consistently associated with lower academic performance. As a suspended child's education is in interrupted, he or she is more likely to fall behind, to become disengaged from school and to drop out. Discipline versus punishment. Discipline and punishment are often used as synonymous terms, but they are actually two different things. Discipline is the practice of training someone to behave in accordance with rules or a code of behavior. The word discipline comes from the Latin words disciplinia, which is teaching, learning, or instruction, and disciplus, meaning discipline or pupil. To discipline means to teach. To teach is to show and explain how to do something. It focuses on teaching the desirable future behavior. To punish is to inflict suffering for a past behavior. The difference between discipline and punishment goes deeper than just the meaning of the words. There is also a difference in how a child's brain reacts to them. Punishment is not um, just philosophically bad. It is actually harmful to brains. So when we look at it, um, if you want to frame it, discipline is when we're working to teach before behavior occurs and punishment is something we do after a behavior occurs. What about interventions? So we're thinking about interventions 
we're thinking about targeted instruction that's based on student need. So student needs that are identified through data. Interventions are designed to supplement and complement the general education curriculum. It is a systematic compilation and implementation of well-researched or evidence-based specific instructional behavioral strategies and techniques. And you can find these techniques on um, certain websites such as What Works Clearinghouse or Intervention Central. Um, and finally, it includes a plan for progress monitoring student outcomes and measuring fidelity of implementation. Coordination and results of team members. Team members work to establish and maintain a safe and healthy instructional climate for all students through establishing a multi-tier system of support or MTSS that promotes positive relationships between adults and students where school climate is improved. It's also designed to help teachers develop individualized positive behavior support plans in order to reduce the frequency of negative student behavior as a part of tier three supports or as part of a student's IEP. Part of the teams and the principal's um, responsibilities is to both understand and successfully implement a student's positive behavior support plan. Principals who do not value or assure positive behavior support plans are fulfilled may inadvertently make a student's behavior worse. Strategically, we're also working to develop systemic alternatives to suspension and expulsions. The time to plan for alternatives to suspension and expulsions is when your team is not in crisis. Review the options, consider selecting three alternatives, and then action plan forward to tie down procedural logistics. And then finally, we'll use data. We're using data to both inform the presence of new interventions and to determine the effectiveness of interventions that have been implemented. So now let's talk about manifestation determination. When should a manifestation determination be completed? Um, this term was first introduced uh, to us in 1997 with the amendments to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And something to note as we're going through the manifestation determination information is to refer back to uh, the patent uh, resource on manifestation determinations. In addition to, at some point, there will be a new basic education circular uh, that comes out around manifestation determination that you'll want to refer to. So now we're going to talk a, a little bit about a case study um, that sets some precedence in uh, manifestation determinations. We'll talk about team members, um, the role of the school psychologist, We'll look at some data sources. Uh, we'll look at the regulatory uh, areas around manifestation determination and assessment. So as you see here, um, the, the legal uh, case study that we're going to refer to is the Honig versus Doe uh, that happened in 1988. Um, this case is, is pertinent to, to talking about manifestation determination as it impacted practices relating to suspending and expelling students with disabilities, as well as prompted uh, the mandated manifestation determination process. Um, students who are deemed dangerous to others may be suspended up to 10 school days. This gives individuals a cooling down period in which a new IEP can be initiated. A change of placement is not a guarantee for students who have been suspended more than 10 days. The decision in the Honig versus Doe case represents the principle of zero reject, meaning that it is unacceptable to change the placement or remove the student from school due to their disability. Students are to continue receiving a free appropriate public education, even if they have been suspended or expelled. The Education of the Handicap Act contains a provision known as the stay put provision, which provides that a handicapped child shall remain with his or her current educational placement pending completion of any review proceedings, unless the parents and state or local education agencies agree to the removal. So let's go back to the uh, Honig versus Doe case, um, just to give you a little a bit of feedback on how that came to be. So John Doe was a student at the Louise Lombard School a Developmental Center for Disabled Children. 
He had a disability which caused him considerable difficulty in controlling his impulses. On November 6, 1980, he was teased by a fellow student and responded by attacking the student and kicking out a school window. He was subsequently suspended pending expulsion uh, proceedings. After unsuccessfully protesting the suspension by letter, he brought an action against the school authorities under the Education of the Handicapped Act. The handicapped students asked the district court to enter an order requiring the school to allow the students to return to their own schools. The district court granted the students with handicaps request and issued a permanent injunction, an order which prevented the school district from indefinitely suspending a student for a disability related misconduct. So again, please keep that in mind as we go through and talk about manifestation determination. MDRT members, the membership of the decision-making group should include a district representative, parent, and other relevant members to be determined by agreement of the parent and the LEA. So manifestation determination teams must evaluate the relationship between a single behavioral occurrence and the student's disability, and then be able to defend the decision that they've made through the use of data. Consequently, manifestation determination teams are urged to include all relevant evaluation data and to, include, and to include all IEP team members who have knowledge of the child and his or her behavior across settings and time. The National Association of School Psychologists recommends the inclusion of school psychs on MDR teams. With their considerable expertise in comprehensive assessment and intervention, school psychologists need to be involved in a thorough non-discriminatory assessment of a student who has violated a school disciplinary policy in order to have the best information available for a manifestation determination. School psychologists have extensive training in multidimensional assessment to capture possibly potent factors underlying a student's behavior behavior rating scale data from parents, teachers, and students, and the student themselves, interviews of parent and teachers, clinical interviews with the child, direct observation and assessment of personality, social skills, reasoning, comorbid conditions, achievement, and educational performance. Equally important with the knowledge that minority students with disabilities are suspended at a higher rate than non-minority students, they are also mindful of non-discriminatory assessment components learning ecology, language proficiency, opportunity for learning, and educationally relevant cultural and linguistic factors. The exper the, this experience with assessment practices, as well as in behavior analysis and the understanding of the characteristics, behaviors, and needs of students with disabilities make them valuable team members. To that end, they are encouraged to be a member of the manifestation determination team, assist the team in gathering all pertinent and necessary information that will be useful in making and supporting an informed decision, along with considering real student needs, and provide a written report citing the data that were used to make the decision, to make the decision in addition to completing a manifestation determination record form at the IEP meeting. Some data sources that should be looked at by the manifestation determination review team, as you see here, are things such as the teacher and parents uh, providing a record of the past behavior at school and at home in order to determine if there is a predictable behavioral pattern or evidence of a behavior similar to the incident that's being reviewed. Uh, the IEP goals uh, for positive behavior change in their implementation, have they been implemented by the teachers uh, uh, and the school district um, as written in the IEP? Have there been antecedents to this incident per the understanding of the student and observers? Have the parents shared with you or have you asked the parents if the child has new health or medication information that could impact the behavior um, that you're reviewing? Have there been recent changes in the family or in the school experience that could negatively impact behavior? And really overarching, what's the emotional status of the student, including his or her understanding of the incident? All of these sources of information are consistent with the requirements of the law, with the appropriate addition of the student 
um, as discussed there at the end, as a source and the most important stakeholder in this process. Five of these six components address behavior across settings and across time. Only the emotional status of the student is added as the team considers the behavior, the disability, and the impact of consequences. So now let's look at the regulatory background of manifestation determination. IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, discipline procedures require school systems to conduct what is known as a manifestation determination review. The purpose of this review is to determine whether or not the child's behavior that led to the disciplinary infraction is linked to his or her disability. This means that students with disabilities cannot be disciplined for behaviors that are directly related to or are manifestations of their disabilities. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. So what is considered a disciplinary change of placement? This disciplinary change of placement occurs when a student who is receiving special education services is excluded from school for more than 10 school days in a row or for more than 15 school days in any one school year, or when days 11 through 15 constitute a pattern of exclusion. Again, you may ask, what is a pattern? Um, this is something that the team decides um, to, to uh, look at if it was a pattern um, of being out of school and of being excluded. And again, uh, we can't heavily emphasize enough for even one school day for a student with an intellectual disability, it would be considered a disciplinary change of placement. Okay, now let's talk about weapons, drugs, and serious bodily injury. LEAs may unilaterally remove a student with a disability to an interim alternative education setting for up to 45 school days when the student, one, carries a weapon, two, knowingly possesses or uses illegal drugs, sells or solicits them, or three, has inflicted serious bodily injury upon another person while at school. Let's further define what we mean by weapon. It has the meaning given the term dangerous weapon and is defined as a weapon, device, instrument, material or substance, animate or inanimate that is used for or is readily capable of causing death or serious bodily injury, except that such term does not include a pocket knife with a blade of less than two and a half inches in length. Now let's talk further about serious bodily injury. Oftentimes this definition is not looked at by folks and students are removed for something that really was not a serious bodily injury. Bodily injury, which creates a substantial risk of death or which causes serious permanent disfigurement or protracted loss or impairment of the function of any bodily member or organ. Again, please make sure that you're following each one of these definitions before removal uh, to an interim alternative education setting. So let's look at two questions when assessing manifestation of behavior. Was the behavior caused by or directly and substantially related to the student's disability? And was the behavior the direct result of the LEA's failure to implement the IEP? Remember that except for students with an intellectual disability, that the number of days under the thresholds, the LEA is within limits to suspend according to their policies. Again, remembering the relevant members are people who know the student very well, and it does not need to be the exact same people on the IEP team. It's decided by the parent and the LEA, and we're going to walk further into the manifestation flow chart to look at these two questions. So if the answer to either question is yes, the behavior is a manifestation, looking at the very top box on the left. The IEP team must either conduct an FBA or 
if a positive behavior support plan already has been developed, review that positive behavior support plan and modify it. And if necessary, um, to address the behavior and return the student to the placement from which the student was removed, unless of course the parent and LEA agree to the change of placement. The top right box answering that question, if the answer to both questions is no, the behavior is not a manifestation. The student may be disciplined in the same manner as a student without a disability who has violated the same or similar code of conduct. Again, this information comes from page two of the manifestation determination publication put out by Patton. So when do we complete an FBA? When the school refers the student to law enforcement, when the student is removed from their current placement as a result of weapon possession, illegal drug possession, or use of and or serious bodily harm. When a student is removed from their placement for more than 10 consecutive or 15 cumulative school days and the behavior is determined to be related to his or her disability. Under chapter 14, our state regulations, subsequent to a referral to law enforcement for students with disabilities who have positive behavior support plans, an updated functional behavior assessment and positive behavior support plan is required. And remember, when you conduct an FBA, get the parent's permission. So just a reminder of a free appropriate public education IDEA 2004 makes it clear that FAPE must be made available to students eligible for special education, including students who have been suspended or expelled from school. This means that LEAs must maintain the provision of a free appropriate public education to a student eligible for special education during all disciplinary exclusions, including those involving 10 consecutive school days or more than 15 cumulative school days in a school year. And here we're just reminding you of our Office for Dispute Resolution and their hearing decisions and considerations for reflection. The Office for Dispute Resolution provides resources for parents and educational agencies to resolve educational disputes for children served by students with disabilities or thought to have disabilities. And again, uh, you see their website on the screen and you can also read about um, local Pennsylvania uh, cases uh, in regards to manifestation determination and discipline. Our content featured in presentation endorses the federal indicators highlighted in yellow or orange here on your screen. Data reporting, compliance monitoring, and training and technical supports are typically aligned to these indicators from the district level to the state level to the federal indicators. On the screen, you'll find our patent publications. Uh, this is specific to our presentation today, and we would highly encourage you to uh, go to our patent website and uh, locate this information to provide uh, to your teams as a further resource uh, in the development of uh, your team's training. So here on the screen, Manifestation Determination Worksheet, and if you go to our patent website, you can uh, certainly um, order a patent publication uh, into your um, district or charter school. The resources listed are referenced throughout our presentation today. Please consider using these to train and support your teams. We thank you for joining us today. Uh, for further questions, please feel free to reach out to your AEDY point of contact. If you are not aware of your specific uh, point of contact, please reach out to AEDY at patent.net. Again, that is uh, AEDY at patent.net. 
and um, we will be glad to support uh, any of your questions or training and technical uh, support needs. Thank you.